On the Korean Nintendo Web fandom, I discovered an analogy post that describes my feelings on Pokemon Scott and Violet perfectly. I'll translate it for you, and in the original post they used the analogy of Korean dishes kukbap and fish roast, but I'll change it to the usual hamburgers like in the past. <clears throat> Pokemon Scott and Violet. A 20-year-old burger restaurant has launched a new burger dish without any changes. But it's familiar, so it tastes good. The game itself is fun because it's Pokemon just like the past. However, recently, the restaurant has got rid of the chairs and now the tables are gone too. They tell the customers to eat the food off the floor. The burger does taste good, but you feel like crap and you're asking yourself why you're paying money to eat this and be treated like garbage. Also, people passing by the streets who don't eat hamburgers are watching from outside the window and calling the customers idiots. Those guys must be crazy! Are those guys humans? Hunting for a Chinese XIV in the toe? Anyone got both scarlet and violet? Hey chef, is there any DLC yet? Why does this taste good? Lick the food off the floor, you little shits! Part 1. Frustrating Unfinished Glitches Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is the most frustrating Pokemon game since Pokemon X and Y. Just like the Kalos games, I see a lot of potential for Scarlet and Violet. The core gameplay I enjoyed, and there were some really good moments. To me, Scarlet and Violet is the best Pokemon game since Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, and if you know me, that means a hell lot. But, it's ruined by the glitches and the atrocious graphics, and I feel bad for the developers Shigeru Mori and Game Freak because it's obvious they are forced to develop on a tight schedule. Mind you, this is the third Pokemon game coming out in the span of a year. Of course it's gonna be incomplete, rushed with cutting corners. They developed two games side by side in three years! I have already made a video detailing my thoughts on this game's dev history and Pokemon's annual release problem. Go check it out if you want more in-depth thoughts and analysis. I hope someone makes a documentary about the development of Legends and Gen 9 Get Back style one day, because I wonder what the process was like. Just imagine what the office movie would have been like. One part of the room is a bunch of hard-working, desperate developers. Shigeru Mori is probably scared out of his wits about the state of the game. Young or low-class Game Freak developers having mental breakdowns in their seats. Junichi Masuda packing his stuff to escape. And the other party off is basically the higher up managers of Pokemon Company, acting like those people in Wolf of Wall Street with the bucket loads of cash they earned. $22 million in three f***ing hours! <laughs> and cheering playing music on his guitar, and Nishihara banging prostitutes while sniffing cocaine up their ass with all the money he's gained over the years. Okay, maybe slight exaggeration. Still, no matter what situation the game devs were in, we're here to discuss the end product. I think I should make this clear first. This game already failed as a video game, despite the praise I might give later in the video, because it's not acceptable to release a game in this kind of unfinished state, no matter the good stuff or what patches they might do in the future. Yes, I did enjoy this game, but this game failed the basics. Like I said in the intro, this game is like a restaurant. The food they serve might taste good, but if the restaurant doesn't have chairs or tables or plates or forks, and you have to eat it off the floor, it's a bad restaurant. If you actually think this game is a finished product, or it's Nintendo Switch's weak hardware's fault, I suggest shutting off the review right now and go take a wank. Bugs, bugs, the bugs, oh my, there are just too many of them. I mean, this is the first Nintendo published game that I was wondering if it was ghost directed by the guy who said 16 times the detail. Frame rate drops. Lighting bugs. Uh... Textures glitching out. Teleporting to the sky. Falling through the floor to the mystery zone. The NPCs themselves commit Sudoku to escape this game. Faraway objects drop frame rate to single digits. Too many objects in one scene also drops frame rate. Random Pokeballs everywhere. Eyeballs popping out. Player turning into the smartest man alive. Rocks don't hurt you. Small child gets drilled during battle. Get ready for five nights at Arvin's jump scare. Arms glitching and turning. Forget Iron Bundle, Delibird is now a final boss god. Super easy backwards long jump to go up places you normally can't reach to skip areas. Duplicating shinies. Miraidon does a mating call. 
Run faster with two controllers. Bike turns invisible. Save fog corrupts so it's not just graphical errors. Get soft locked on an island before unlocking your rideable Pokemon. Jump around roadblock walls easily. Facial expression remains the same. Facial expression glitches. Gold looks like a bacon, I guess. NPCs using Trace's blink ability. Zipia toe filter not going away after flashback cutscene. Trainer lays an egg and Eevee. Toy Story sits cannibal toys. Charizard gets the spirit tomb texture disease. Moon is a physical object that can be interacted with. Biblically accurate magneton. Breaking Bad reference because it's a crystal. Pokemon abandon you during picnics. Walking on water like Jesus Christ. Michael Jacksoning. Just to name a few. That's why I give my kids Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. The fool. <laughs> this is so sad. Rotophone, play Country Roads. Almost heaven, West Balia, Medali Mountains, Glacia, the River. Okay, enough with the parodies. You get my point. This game is a mess with the amount of glitches. It honestly deserves the user score it got in Metacritic. The critical reviews aren't that great either, considering how much critics loved awful past games like USUM and Sword and Shield. The saddest thing is, all of this could have been ironed out easily if they were just given more time. And Gen 9 could have been pretty enjoyable games. The only reason this game was unfinished was because some greedy idiot at the Pokemon Company ordered three games in the span of a year. And Tanikas Ishihara, I hope you go eat a big fat bag of fired. Part 2 Incomplete Game. Other than really bad visuals, frame rate, or glitches, let's just go over the things that are obviously not finished in this game. Because, who boy, these things are obvious as your childhood's crush's sign that she doesn't want you, that this game is rushed as hell. First, the obvious Paldia is an open world game. Just like the other Pokemon games before, there's many towns and villages across the land of Paldia to explore. But shockingly, there's almost no building interiors. Almost all of the towns in this game, the buildings are for exaggeration, and you cannot enter them. I think except for the main hub, schools, and gyms, there's literally only the sandwich shop that has interiors. Every other shop like Mart and clothing stores just got stock menu inventory. I also noticed some special looking buildings such as a post office or warehouses that were obviously meant for a feature that got cut out because they couldn't make said feature. I would ask why the game is like this, what's the reason? But I know the answer to that question. It's rushing, lazy, and cutting corners. The problem is that this is bad for world building. I know in the past Pokemon games, most NPC houses were kind of pointless and didn't serve any purpose in the gameplay sense. But it was fun to just walk around cities and Pokemon games, talk to NPCs and listen to what their lives are like. Some can even provide lore about the region or legendary Pokemon, some can just be straight up comedy. But that's not present in this game, because again... At least I can say the NPCs move around in this game, but they often glitch out or have poor draw distance. I guess we know why NPCs just do still like weeping angels in a certain other crappy Pokemon game. It's because they knew they would screw it up if they made them move. So I guess it's a pick your poison situation. Would you rather have lifeless, lazy, jube dead villagers, or NPCs walking around while doing the robot? Second, the clothes. I'm gonna replay footage of an old video from mine. This is from the USUM review, when I said Pokemon games will keep getting worse and we will look back at certain things fondly. I often make quotes that age well, my children, and this is one of them. I guess Game Freak is following the strategy of two steps back every installment so that games we thought that were crap when it came out will look good in the future. I bet you there will be things in Sword and Shield we'll look back fondly five years from now at this rate. But hey, at least they gave us clothes. 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 I told you. What did I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Cause I told you. Mm -hmm. You cannot change your clothes in this game, despite clothes shops existing. You can change your hat, your glasses, your socks, your gloves, but you cannot change their shirt and pants. Why are there no clothes options in this game? Yeah, I know you're a student, but it's a lazy excuse. They could have made it so that you only have to wear the clothes on school grounds and take it off when you're outside. It's again obvious they didn't have time to design clothes. Being able to only change your socks or shoes is dumb, so it makes clothes options useless. Also, the school uniform looks ugly. There, I said it. Third, the eating animations. My god, just look at what happens when you eat food. <laughs> that is so bad. 
bad. He's like, How are they selling this for like 60? What? Is your character a puppy eating out of a bull? This kind of animation is unacceptable for a $60 HD game. Worse, even Sword and Shield have proper eating animations when you eat curry. Another downgrade just like the clothes. Also, the graphics. It's not just plain bad. No, this game is weirdly inconsistent which is another sign of unfinished. The draw distance is bad and textures of the overworld are bad. The frame rate is bad and everything stutters. But the textures of the characters' models are great. The fabric of the clothes people wear is really highly detailed. Look at Nimona's shirt. That's real fabric. Oh, one of those Team Star admins. That rubber shoes makes her look like she belongs in that rubber fetish club from the third Matrix movie. The hair of characters look like real hair compared to the cartoony plasticiness of the previous generation. I am honestly impressed by the texture of character models in this game. The texture of the Pokemon also look very good. In the past generation, every Pokemon had cartoony plastic textures, but now, Pokemon have unique textures and effects based on the kind of Pokemon they are, making them more realistic. For example, the bread Pokemon actually has bread-esque textures, metallic Pokemon like Magnezone shine like real metal, you get my point. This is all nice and neat, so the question is, if they could make the Pokemon look good, why couldn't the entire game look like this? Another minor thing that's missing in the game, most of you have not noticed. Where is the traditional opening title screen with the main Pokemon theme? Every Pokemon game, except Legends Arceus, which was probably an artistic decision to rip off Breath of the Wild's quiet atmosphere style, showed off a cool animated cinematic that showed off the game's demo or story. But it's not present in Scarlet and Violet. Instead, we get the single image with stock school sound effects. Did they not even have time to animate a proper opening title screen? Worse, they even got a proper Pokemon theme, and I think they even got a real band to play this, but it only plays after you beat the game, and you can barely hear the thing from all the school noises. <laughs> Lastly, this game basically has no post-game either. There's this 2 hour quest where you battle the gyms again, but that's it. No post-game area to explore, no post-game battle facility. Even Gen 6, 7, and 8 had the audacity to include a battle tower. The developers either A, didn't have time or resources, or B, they're gonna sell it back to us as DLC. What is this, EA or Blizzard? Is Pokemon swooping that low now? Is the reason there are no clothes is because we're gonna get loot boxes or battle passes for costumes as microtransactions? Are we gonna get a major update of the game that's called a sequel, but it's not a sequel, called Pokemon Scarlet and Violet 2 Part 3? The world of Paldea. <sighs> let's talk about the actual game now, because that's what most of the big mouth YouTubers aren't talking about. So let's say Pokemon Scarlet was not a buggy mess and didn't like a GameCube game. And obvious features that are missing were there. Like that's ever gonna happen. Is it a great game? Well, since this is the first real open world Pokemon game, I think the first thing we should talk about is the open world design of Paldea. I will say, Paldea was more engaging to me than Hisui and 1000 times less sleep inducing than Galar. I actually had some fun exploring Paldea despite the visuals, and there were some places in the map that I distinctly remember, like those windmills. There's actual places of interest like towers you can climb, random caves on the map to explore, and summits to jump off of. Let's compare it to Legends Arceus. Hisui was just barren, empty fields after fields. Zero reason to explore the region except to catch Pokemon. There were no caves or dungeons with rewards to explore, no trainers to fight in the overworld, no towns or people to find except those pathetic clan tents. Just a lot of wild Pokemon. That was my main gripe with the game, because they gave up on map design and solely focused on the catching mechanic. Conversely for this game, there are plenty of Pokemon trainers to find. There were actual landmarks that encouraged exploration. Oh, there's this huge mountain shaped like a penis? Well, you have to go through a complex cave system to reach a town that's on top of it. You can find a tough gym. There's also Summit too, and you can find items and rare Pokemon. Gasp! Exploration and reward in a Pokemon game? I haven't felt that since like 2014! Also, there were neat areas like this cave which was actually so complex that I got lost in it, and I have stumbled upon a high level Lucario that tried to maul me, and a short parkour course that rewarded me with a rare candy. This was the things I was missing in Legends Arceus. Never forgetting and forgiving when Mount Cornet was massacred and downgraded to a simple Ultra Megalopolis style tunnel. I mean, the place does look like garbage barf mud, but at least it's not embarrassing mines in Galar. I also like that you can find trainers to battle, but they're optional. 
When I first saw in the trailer that trainers no longer battle you automatically when seeing you, and you have to talk to them manually to battle, I thought that would be strange. But I ended up liking it because they gave you the freedom of choice. You can just skip trainer battles if you want if you're busy, but you want to battle because you just want the experience and they incentivize it by giving you items if you battle all trainers in one area. Freedom of choice is something this franchise desperately needed, so I welcome this change. Also, there are cities and towns to explore that's just not the main city. Cough, cough, Jew, lazy village. And again, I've never been to Spain, so I cannot judge if they did a good job capturing Spain's culture. Spanish people tell me in the comments, but I appreciate all of them looking unique. Paldia does feel unique and refreshing compared to other regions, especially Galar and Kalos. Still, can't go into those darn houses. Also, a lot of buildings are for show and serve no purpose like the one in that electric city. Disgusting. I guess despite the exploration being fun, the biggest problem of Paldia is because the cities are so barren, there's no side stuff to do. Like, there's plenty of stuff to do in the main campaign unlike Legends Arceus. I felt some fun progressing through the story. But, I don't think I've run into one side quest given by an NPC. A side story that involves something that has nothing to do with the main plot. Again, it's a shame because these kind of things could have been added easily if they were given more time to make the stupid game. Just like most modern Pokemon games, they just try with low effort as possible and not enough. Ugh, this game is frustrating. Despite that, exploring Paldius map was the main reason I enjoyed this game to be honest. It actually felt like a real game when I was discovering new Pokemon, new NPC, new story moments, at least when I wasn't glitching out. I recently started replaying Pokemon Sword and Shield and my god, that game is worse now after playing this because you feel like you're on a conveyor belt with your hand being held everywhere. The world is so claustrophobic and linear and lazy and stupid. You're running into shitty characters like Hop, Neon, and Sonya every 5 minutes. There is no freedom of choice and exploration. Where Scarlet and Violet did well. For this reason, I'll take Scarlet and Violet over its Sword and Shield any day. Part 4 The Structure of Paldea. Let's also talk about the overall structure of the game, too. They really did commit to making an open world Pokemon game, and I like how they structured this game. You see, they basically split the game into three sections. There's 18 Pokemon types, right? When I saw that Sundial at the Hub City in the trailer, I was worried they were gonna do the Sun and Moon thing where they make 7 or 8 gyms, and the rest of the types half as it. RIP Dragon Guy and Golf Course. But thankfully, they did not do that. They split the 18 types into three categories, assigning each type to 8 gym leaders, 5 Teen Star Captains, and 5 Boss Wild Pokemon, which feel like the Totem Pokemon from Alola. Also, the story was divided into three, with the Gym Leader Challenge story being the classic trying to become Pokemon Champion plot, Team Star storyline being the Villain plot, and the Totem Pokemon storyline being the Legendary plot. They also created three different rivals, Nimona's the rival in charge of the League plot, Penny is the rival in charge of the Villain plot, and Arvin is in charge of the Legendary Pokemon plot, and at the end, all three plots converge into one final ending with all your rivals coming together for one final showdown at Area Zero. I like how they categorize and structured everything. I like how neat and tidy this game is despite being an open world game. Open world games can be overwhelming if they just throw out random stuff of everything at the player at once. Looking at you, Generex Ubisoft open world game number 151. Also, one of my biggest problems with the past game was the constant hand-holding with character encounters every 5 minutes to explain everything in lazy cutscenes. But this game, you can beat in any order you want. If you get tired of the Arvin plot, you can just do gyms. If you get tired of gyms, you can do the Team Star plot. If you get tired of all of them, you can just wander around aimlessly without purpose and just find random stuff or find Mew Wild Pokemon. I like the hands-off approach, so much more refreshing than the previous two generations of games. And if you think about it, every past Pokemon game since Red and Green had a Pokemon Master plot, Villain plot, and Legendary plot. So it was clever dividing the game to three for an open world format. Therefore, the rest of the review will be categorized into three parts. However, before we do that, we have to talk about a severe problem of this game that makes the structure flawed. And that is the lack of part 5. Level scaling and the art of open world games. The biggest problem for this game that's not glitches or graphics is the lack of a level scaling for me. What does a lack of level scaling mean? Well, it means despite the fact that you can challenge all the gyms and missions in any order you want, the level of the Pokemon that are used by the bosses remain the same. This means that despite being an open world game, the game kind of forces you to take a linear order of the bosses and areas you must go. Because if you don't, problems will happen. 
If you go to a high level area, your Pokemon can't beat them because almost any Pokemon that's 10 levels higher than you will just outspeed and one-shot you. And even if you somehow beat a hard area or accidentally skip easy areas to come back to an easy area, the bosses will have lower levels than you so the game will be piss easy. It's a mess! You can't even go to a hard area, catch a high level wild Pokemon with sheer luck and tackle high level bosses. Because unlike previous games where only traded high level Pokemon disobeyed you, in this game, high level Pokemon will disobey you, even if you caught it yourself without the adequate number of badges. I heard someone in the comments say that it's fine to have it like this because you can grind your Pokemon levels, you can just grind with wild Pokemon and random trainers so you can beat the hardest gym first or something. But if you're gonna do that and waste time, why grind at all? Why not spend that time actually progressing the story and other parts of the game? And this still doesn't fix the problem of low level gyms getting way too easy after beating hard ones. What's worse is that the game is vague on what order you should defeat areas. They don't display what the average level of a gym leader is, for example. On the map, they say vague phrases to describe them like, This gym is a good fit for those with battle experience, or This dude is in the middle of the pack. Why can't you just tell me the order if you have an order in mind? It confused me and screwed up the difficulty. For example, I didn't realize Grusha, the Ice-type fanboy snowboarder dude, was supposed to be the final gym leader. After all, the map doesn't mention that he's the strongest gym leader, it just says he's just a retired snowboarder dude, nothing else. So I lost him, fought him during the middle point of the story, barely beat him, and discovered that every other gym leader after him is easier. So the rest of the game was a cakewalk! You know what this game needed? A level scaling algorithm. Have the opponent's trainer's Pokemon levels be determined by the average level of your own Pokemon so it matches how much you progress in the story. Or if that doesn't work, assign 8 or 5 different teams per bosses. What do I mean by that? Well, I know a Pokemon open world level scaling can work because I've seen it happen. I really talk about Pokemon fan ROM hacks, but I feel the need to do so now. And I want to talk about Pokemon Crystal Clear by Shock Slayer. A ROM hack of Pokemon Crystal that turned it into an open world game. Pika Spray Yellow has a good video showcasing the ROM hack, so if you want to see all the features, I suggest checking his video out. Anyways, in Pokemon Crystal Clear, the game was turned into an open world game, and you can battle all the 16 Kanto plus Johto gym leaders in any order you want. How did that work in that game? Well, every gym leader has 16 varying teams, and they battle you with a team depending on how many badges you have. So, if you have 0 badges and battle Claire, who's the final gym leader in the real game, her team will be easy with level 7 Jartinis, and if you have 16 badges and battle Faulkner, who's the first gym leader in the real game, his team will be the strongest yet with level 70 Pokemon. Through this way, you can battle all the Kanto and Johto leaders in any order you want without having to worry about Pokemon levels. A truly open world Pokemon game. You know, in the Pokemon universe, I always thought it was implied gym leaders go easy on you for a fair fight if you have less badges. The gym leaders don't fight you with their real team. When you rematch them in the post game with their full 6 Pokemon team, is when they show their real power and their real team. Sort of like how I was explained in Pokemon Origins when Brock only used 2 Pokemon because Red had 0 badges at that point. They really should have done it for Scott and Violet too, where Pokemon teams will be based around how many badges you have. Was this so hard to implement? It would have just needed like a week more of programming. I want to also compare SV to other open world games because there might still be some people who might be still saying it's fine not to have level scaling. One big open world game I can think of that does not have level scaling is Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is a great game that does not have level scaling. Every level of monsters is fixed. But here's the reason why Witcher 3 works. First of all, Witcher 3 is actually not fully open world. It's divided into multiple areas, that being White Orchard, Velen, Novigrad, Skellige, Karamohan, and DLC area Toussaint. So there is some structure to the progression. It's not complete open like Paldea. I mean, they did try to put some harder bosses at hard to go places, like the final dragon trial is in an area that requires surf, the final team star area is in Hazardous Hills, and the final gin trial is on top of a mountain summit. But these are the exceptions. Everything else in Paldea don't have natural barriers. Second, the biggest difference, Witcher 3 does have levels like an RPG, but it's a real-time action game, not a turn-based game. This means, even if you have low levels, if you just have the skills to get good, you can beat anything by dodging and rolling or something. While on Pokemon, it's near impossible to beat a boss 10 levels higher than you because it's a turn-based RPG, unless you grind, which beats the whole purpose again. 
I think the game that did this most right is Zelda Breath of the Wild. Yeah, I know I keep bringing up Zelda and comparing it to Pokemon. But it's kind of hard not to when Pokemon has made two or three inferior copies of Zelda. Goddamn Zelda wannabes. There is level scaling in the game where more stronger mobs appear as you make more accomplishments in the game. I.e. more difficulty colored Bokoblins will appear for example. But the game still naturally shows you the order the game wants you to beat. While at the same time, allowing the player to progress in any order they please. After all, the water and wind area is the easiest to progress, and the fire and desert area is the most treacherous part of the game. But since there is level scaling with the monsters spawning, players are still allowed to beat the Gerudo area first, for example, even if it'll be hard as shit to go through areas like Iga Clan Hideout with low class gear. <sighs> Anyways. Before I move on though, I must defend the game a bit. The game's intended level curve, the order of the gyms and challenges the game wants you to do, is all over the place. I've seen this photo circulate online, saying Game Freak is brainless for designing the open world to be like this, but I disagree, and I think this was done intentionally by the game developers. After all, one of my problems about the series, especially Galar, was the game didn't make you explore at all. It was just a linear path from south to north, so making you basically go back and forth all over places I think was a good idea. Because it's an open world game, you won't be taking the same routes all the time, and you'll be taking advantage of the fast travel spots. I prefer the cobweb, unlinear, messy design over boring Galar. Part 6 Victory Road <sighs> Finally, let's talk about the main meat of the game. Firstly, the classic beating 8 gyms and getting to the champion. Firstly, I like all the gym leaders and LE4s themselves. While I find it a bit weird they spilled what the gym leaders looked like on the math screen, I did like all the characters except for one, and they were memorable. If you think this game sucks because the character designs are woke or some stupid shit, I suggest you go eat a big fat bag of... Finding Friends. I remember seeing idiots on Twitter saying Rika is bad and calling her design woke. You all cultured swines. You guys just don't get what real hot women are like. The character design in this game is great, not just the gym leaders. Except for the main characters, but you can decorate them easily. I like how diverse all the gym characters look, just like the previous 5 generations. They're all animated pretty well, and they just pop off the screen because of their wild personalities. I mean, I would like to give kudos to the person at Game Freak who thought a black old lady who does rapping should become a gym leader. The creativity of the character designs in this game is off the charts. I thought I'd never see Moist Critical the YouTuber, the protagonist from Fire Emblem Engage, Raul Silva from Skyfall, Inspector Gadget, Batwoman Kate Kane, generic male K-pop star, Hubert of House Vestra, Giga Chad, and Bella Delphine in one single game, let alone a Pokemon game. Game Freak's character design team did a great job. The main highlight is of course Larry. I like how his whole concept is that he's just a normal guy, and it makes him so special. I know he's a blatant parody of Kodoku no Gurume, a popular Japanese TV show, but that just makes him more awesome. Haraga. Hetta. I like how he's basically a self-insert by the developers at Game Freak, a wage slave that's mistreated by an asshole boss that makes him overwork, do stuff he does not want. He also ends up being the most special gym leader, because he's the first in the series where he uses two types in one game. I also like when you first meet him during the gym trial, you don't realize it's him, but that's the leader. But speaking of gym trials, let's talk about another negative aspect. You know how Pokemon games make you solve a puzzle while battling trainers before battling the leader, right? Well, in this game, it's that too, but the puzzles are so lame. What is this? Finding Wally slash Waldo? This is for babies! Really? Simon says? Is this the best they could come up with? There's a game called Echo, which is basically Simon Says. Come on, that thing was in every toy store in the 80s. Did we really need a watered-down version on a Pokemon cartridge? The Ice-type gym leader makes you complete a snowboard course as a challenge, which is fair enough, but look at how short the snowboard trial is, and look at how much time they give you so that so much time remains. Was it designed for mentally handicapped people? Remember when Pokemon games gym puzzles were actual brain teasers that gave Zelda dungeons run for their money? Ugh, anyway. Let's also talk about Nemona. I've seen so many people talk and lust over her, and I agree, she's a pretty likable rival. But not many people ask why she's so likable. Well, I know the reason, and it's because she's so goddamn simple. She's stupid. Her character is an idiot that just knows nothing except battling, and keeps asking you for battles like some creepy Yandere bitch. 
I was sick and tired of rivals with backstories I don't give two shits about, or rivals that become the main focus of the story so it gets annoying, or rivals with boring character arcs in the past games, so a simple idiot rival was very refreshing to me. Go go Nemana, I'll become your rival to the bitter end. Part 7, Star Fall Street. Let's start talking about Team Star plotline next, because out of the three pillars of the game, this was the one I liked least. First of all though, I want to ask you this question. In this game, you're a student and you attend an academy. What is the purpose of a school setting in a gameplay sense in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet? No really, why is there a school in this game? What does it add to the gameplay? I asked this question in a previous video, and I kid you not, I didn't get one single solid answer. Usually games that have students as main characters or have it set in a school have perfectly good reasons. For example, Fire Emblem Three Houses again. That game, you play as the teacher at an army school thingy, and your students are your units. Teaching them so they grow into more useful units is part of the gameplay. What is Pokemon Scarlet and Violet's excuse to be set in a school? Why is there so much focus on the school in this game? Almost every trainer in this game are students. You're forced to wear school uniforms which bring back bad memories to me personally. This is an open world game. Uh, is it just me? But open world games usually have the player not stay in one place and are constantly moving, right? That's kind of the point of open world games. Why is it set in a school? Literally the one place on earth where kids are discouraged not to move. I think you can literally beat the entire game by visiting the school two times without any problem. Once in the beginning and once at the end. The school serves no purpose other than maybe being able to attend these classes that might be useful for brain dead idiots who never played a video game before. But a teaching TV could have solved that. No, I think the only reason the game was set in a school was for the story. And specifically the Team Star storyline. Look, when your game setting is completely contradictory to the genre of the game it is made for, that being boarding school and open world, there's a bit of a problem. And even if you ignore the contradiction, I really did not like the Team Star storyline. First of all though, let's talk about the design of the Team Star grunts. They look so generic. This is the worst antagonist team design in Pokemon history. Even Team Yell grunts look like Giga Chats compared to these guys. I think many will agree with me on this one. But I think not many know the reason why. You see, back in Sword and Shield, all those Team Yell grunts look exactly the same, so they look like an army of clone troopers, right? And people complain about it. This is Tinfoil Hat, but I think this game? They just designed the helmet and goggles for the Team Star grunts so they can just reuse the model of the generic trainer student NPCs to conserve the effort of designing new models for Team Star grunts. That's why they look so bland and forgettable. And their whole concept is a bunch of delinquents. They have set up these bandit camps around Paldea, and your job is to team up with the principal who dressed like Elvis and raid these camps. This could have sounded like a fun idea theoretically, but I think they botched the execution. And the biggest problem is again, it's showing, not telling. These Team Star grunts and their admins slash leaders aren't actually bullies but in reality, misunderstood students who ran away from the school after being bullied. That's good and fine, but we never see them getting bullied on camera. I mean we get these flashback cutscenes of these guys saying, We should form a team and run away! And all their bull crap. But that's still not showing bullying. You just keep talking about getting bullied only in text. I lost interest in the story because I couldn't get invested because it's just lazy cussies with dialogue. The Team Star story was so boring by the end. You know, if the gameplay actually focused around real school life, like the Persona series or something, it would have been engaging. But this is just all window dressing. They should have made a Pokemon game focused on school life and an open world Pokemon game completely different things. It's like missing mint and chocolate for ice cream. Only insane people like that flavor. Also, these Team Star camp raids were so stupid in a gameplay sense too. Even worse than the gym challenges. You just send out random Pokemon and they auto battle Pokemon for you. It's so easy and it just ends up being just clicking the ZR button everywhere. No brain power needed. Worse, again. They give you so much time so there is no chance you'll run out of time. Unless you're 151 days old. Lame. Part 8, Path of Legends. But let's get back to positives, and that's the Arvin and the Legendary storyline. Also, I'm just gonna spoil the entire thing, so spoiler warning. So for this story mode, you go around defeating these huge wild Pokemon that's making a mess in an area, really similar to Total Pokemon in Sun and Moon. There's not much to talk about other than that, you just fight strong boss Pokemon. No, what's more interesting is the story of this mode. While you do this, you're accompanied by one of your rivals, Arvin. So, Arvin, 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 where to start? I think he's just Lily F from Sun and Moon if she was a he with a dick, but, and this is important, executed much better and done right. Both of these guys have the same story, 
they're your friend and the game's plot is them dealing with their parental issues with their mom or dad being assholes, but how are they different? How is Arvin and Lilia done right? Well, first of all, Arvin actually participates in the gameplay and isn't just an annoying text box generator. He actually fights alongside you during the boss wild battles with Pokemon, so he's not a useless tool. And gasp, you can actually battle him during the story. And he's a pretty formidable boss battle with a strong team and could wipe your ass if you're not prepared. I'll take this over that dumb bitch Lilia crossing a bridge be your biggest story arc any day. Second, his whole motivation for the story is trying to gather Los Polos Hermanos crystals to try to cure his sick old dog. And who cannot feel bad about a sick old dog? Aww, that dark type dog ate a sandwich. So cute. Third, just plot wise, execution was done better. Arvin doesn't take charge of the freaking story, and your protagonist doesn't just become a bystander, at least most of the time. Also, he doesn't show up every 5 minutes and only shows up during the wild boss battles, so he doesn't get annoying. He doesn't make you feel like you're on a conveyor belt, is what I'm saying. Go hop to hell, hop. Anyways, let's finally talk about the Area Zero and the ending of the game. And it has most to do with the Arvin plot, so I'll talk about it here. Who boy, I believe that Pokemon Scott and Violet had the best climax and ending in a Pokemon game since Black and White, and that's saying a lot. So, what's so great about it? Well, first of all, I like how they set it up. So in the middle of Paldea, there's this area called Hyrule Castle, I mean Area Zero, that's this mysterious mystical place that no one can enter. The NPCs keep talking about it. There's a book that describes the place in old-timey text. In school, you can take history classes and learn stories about how explorers went into the place and were all horribly maimed and murdered by mysterious beings. One of the problems about previous Pokemon game story was them shoving lore down our throats through four scripted lazy cutscenes. Case in point, they'll constant talking about Darkest Day of Galar by Sonia and Rose. This game, you can skip the library book and classes, so it's optional. But it's interesting to hear about this fantastical, misty, silent hill crater place people keep talking about, so you want to learn about it. This is a really clever way to expand your lore in a game, in my opinion. Also, they set up this mystery around this game's professors, who are Arvid's parents. I played Violet, so the professor was Turo, so I'll talk about him. You keep getting video phone calls from this guy, but never actually see him in person, but people keep talking about him. He's in a mystery box, I mean in a mysterious location, and at the end, turns out he's in Area Zero. So after you finish all three routes, you take all your rivals and enter Area Zero. Now this place, I love how it looks. It looks completely different from the rest of the game. There's some really cool looking crystals everywhere. The music sounds like something out of a near game. Did 80% of the game's budget, time, and effort go in here? <clears throat> Anyways, you keep finding these journal entries, which are optional again, which have Turo talking about time machines and Pokemon from distant future or past. And voila, you actually meet the weird Pokemon called Paradox Pokemon. I love your takes on classic Pokemon, and I really enjoy Paradox Pokemon because they do look really inhuman and freaky. I think they did Cosmic Car better here than Sun and Moon's Ultra Beast. And you reach Turo. Now, I was expecting this guy to be the villain and final boss because Pokemon has had a bad history with shitty, obvious twist villains, and Arvin's story seemed just like a copy of Lilia, and Lilia's mother was the villain in Sun and Moon. But the game got me, and my expectations were subverted, because it turns out, the professor is actually dead. Guy's dead as a doornail. The Turo we've been contacting so far was actually a robot AI from the future. The AI has inherited the professor's feelings and memories, and wants to stop his machine from creating havoc, so it asks the player to stop it. But the robot defense mechanism gets activated, and you fight the AI as the final boss. God damn, I never predicted this twist. I love how twisted and dark this ending is. It's like something out of Earthbound's ending. I also like the glitch effect that happens to show the AI's conflict between humanity and programming. Kinda ironic cause how glitchy the actual game is. Was this a coincidence or did they predict the future? Double irony whammy, damn it. And the room where this battle takes place looks really beautiful with the weird crystal effects everywhere and the strong music, plus the fact that Turo's AI isn't a pushover with the battle. Its ace Pokemon is a paradox form of Gardevoir slash Gallade in Pokemon Violet, and this thing almost kicked my ass. It's one heck of a Pokemon battle as the final boss that satisfies both atmosphere and difficulty. Anyways, what more can I say? Final moments of the game were peak Pokemon. Well executed and again, the best ending and climax is black and white. Kudos! Only if the entire game was made like this, only if they delayed so the game had all basics done right. A restaurant with good food but no tables. So frustrating. Ugh. Part 9. Terrestrialization is good? 
I also want to briefly talk about terrestrialization because I came around it. I still think it's dumb to call it terrestrialization and they should have named it crystallization, but I digress. When I first saw this in the trailers, I thought that it was going to be another stupid gimmick like Dynamax, but I did end up liking it. Why? Well, since Generation 6, Pokemon has been constantly trying and dropping the next generation new features for battles. Generation 6 was Mega Evolution, Generation 7 was Z-Moves, and Generation 8 was Dynamax. But all of these three gimmicks in the end served one purpose, and that was Pokemon gets powerful temporary during battle. It's just different ways of Pokemon going into Super Saiyan mode by changing forms or doing one really strong attack. I thought Terrestrialization was just gonna be that again, but instead of Pokemon turning cooler or bigger, it's Pokemon becoming... <sighs> I ran out of Breaking Bad joke, so uh... Pokemon becoming the third game of Generation 2, let's go with that. But it wasn't that. Terrestrialization is basically a Pokemon changing its type temporarily during battle. Now, I must make it very clear. I'm not a hardcore fan of Pokemon battling or a competitive Pokemon player, so I don't know if this even affected the Pokemon battle meta or something. But, I thought I saw some potential to make battles more interesting. You see, Pokemon temporarily changing its type during battle could be used as clever strategy. This can be used in an interesting way if done right. For example, I had a Nyko stack, the Minecraft Mon, which is a pure rock type Pokemon, but could terrestrialize into a ghost type. It also learned the move Curse. Curse, as you all know, has two effects depending on the type of the user. If you use Curse normally, it raises stats, but when using Curse as a ghost type, you can basically curse the other Pokemon to lose a lot of HP over time. The fact that I could use both Curse effects through terrestrialization with one Pokemon was really interesting to me. Granted, the problem was that the game's bosses don't use terrestrialization very well. I think the only person that used it well was Iono, the goddamn e-girl gym leader. She was an electric type gym leader, but she actually uses Miss Magius, a ghost type Pokemon that could terrestrialize into electric type. Miss Magius had Levitate, meaning it didn't have a weakness to ground type, which was smart to change to electric type, meaning it had no weaknesses. I wish more bosses used terrestrialization well, and maybe they could expand this better in a DLC or later installments. The only other problem I have with terrestrialization is that they made it a bit difficult for a Pokemon to change its terrestrialized type. You need to gather materials and grind to change a Pokemon type, similar to the gathering heart scales in the old games. Just like remembering moves in the old games, I don't get it. Why do they make these kind of things difficult? It's just a stupid inconvenience. Part 10, Minor Stuff. Minor Stuff before we wrap up. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet had the best Pokedex UI to date, and I appreciate that. Pokemon always called the Pokedex an encyclopedia, but it never felt like an encyclopedia. But now, they actually made the Pokedex UI have entries that look like books. The UI kind of reminds me of the Amazon Kindle. It's actually pretty cute and clever. I also like how each Pokemon gets photos instead of just generic sprites or models. Pretty neat. Speaking of Pokemon, I thought the new Pokemon were cool. I know a lot of people say, Oh, certain generation Pokemon design sucks, but I never do that. I just like seeing new creative Pokemon, and this didn't fail too. I really like the new Polly and Pokemon, and I liked how most of the trailers kept them a secret before launch. Personally, my favorite Pokemons were the Garganico line because it reminded me of Minecraft, Fido line because I found a bred Pokemon really hilarious, and Mia Scrata. Hey, I'm not a freaking furry, I just like cool cats in general. Also, it's a ripoff of Puss in Boots from Shrek, and I love the Shrek series. Hey, you wanna see something cool? <laughs> also, the game introduced new evolutions like Generation 8. One of my pet peeves about Sword and Shield was that it introduced region forms, which is fine on its own but they made it so that only certain region forms can evolve. Like, how come only Galarian Farfetch'd got an evolution? I want to see what a Cantonian Surfetch'd would look like. Same goes to Obstagoon. I want the new evolution for all Lunoon, not just the British one. Well, this game, I like how they introduced new evolutions for Pokemon that aren't exclusive to region forms. That being Primate evolving into Annihilate after raging so much, Bisharp evolving into King Gambit after becoming a weeb, and Dunsparce evolving into Dun Dun Sparse to make room for Dun 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 Sparse in Generation 16. There are not many, but I'm happy we got them. Next, Set Mode is gone. You know, I sometimes joke with my friends that Pokemon always had a difficulty option since the beginning, and that is Switch Mode is Easy Mode and Set Mode is Hard Mode. But they took away the option of Set Mode in this game. Why? I really hate this mentality of Game Freak developers of not trusting the players to make decisions or freedom of choice. Forced Pokemon affection? Forced EXP share? Is it so hard to program an on and off button? They just don't trust the players and think the players are brain dead babies. What are they, control freaks? 
I guess they're a bunch of game control freaks. Let's also talk about the battle backgrounds and animations. So, up until Generation 8 in every Pokemon game, anytime a Pokemon battle is placed, the game would transition into a separate battle screen. But in the Generation 8 games, they got lazy with the battle backgrounds with battles taking place in cities, usually being blank voids. So rushed, so cutting corners. But with Lens Arceus, they started having the battles take place without transitioning and happening in the overworld. It worked pretty fine in Legends Arceus, but in this game, they somehow made it weird. During scripted battles like Gym Leader battles, the camera moves on its own and you cannot control it. But it works fine just like the previous game. And it is nice to fight in an environment that looks like a real place. And most of the Gym Leader battles take place in nicely decorated arenas in the cities, which is good. But unscripted battles out in the wild is a completely different story. It's so glitchy. What happened? The camera angles you can move around freely, but often it would make the Pokemon be in an awkward angle or just completely bug out. They really need to debug this battle situation. What's worse is the battle animations. Personally, I don't care that much about high quality animations. That's Distant Kingdom's job. But let me just note that because the battles no longer take place in a separate battle screen, they had to nerf a lot of animations. In the past, for a lot of cool moves, the camera would move on its own and even change the background, but they couldn't do that for this game. So most of the time, Pokemon just stay at the spots when attacking in Gen 9, and it gets super distracting. I think the worst nerf is this move. Just compare the animation of Seismatoss. That's a downgrade. I should also address the lack of voice acting because it's a topic that keeps coming up. This game feels bizarre without voice acting. I'm fine with them not having voice lines in regular text speech cutscenes, but there's plenty of cutscenes in the game where they animated characters' body movement and speech to the script. These kinds of scripted cinematic cutscenes feel weird without voice acting. It really needs to become a feature in Generation 10. But then again, I guess it takes too much time to cast English and Japanese voice actors, have them read lines and record, edit, and then program into the game. When your game is coming out every 5 minutes, right? Ugh. Also, lastly, the multiplayer. Uh, there's Terra raid battles and stuff. I'll let Harrison 4 summarize my thoughts on the thing. Um, I don't care. So in conclusion, Pokemon Scott and Invalid is a mixed bag with some really good and really bad. The exploration of the world was not bad. The structure of the game was neat and tidy. Dividing it into three storylines was acceptable, with two of them working great, and the game served us one kick-ass hell of a finale that is satisfying. There were also nice new features, and overall, it could have been a solid Pokemon game. But I repeat, it could have been a solid Pokemon game. The graphics are the worst in the series, the bugs are not acceptable as a video game, and there should have been level scaling. If this game just invested more time in development, if Game Freak or Pokemon Company didn't make the stupid decision to develop two games side by side in a span of 3 years with only 169 people, if only this game came out next year, it could have been a pretty fine game that saved the Pokemon franchise. But not a single if I listed has happened, and Scott and Violet is just another sad chapter in the what could have been book that is currently being penciled by Tunekazu Ishihara. Well, no matter the game quality, Scott and Violet sold really well again. Big freaking surprise. I guess the foundations of a good game are there, despite all the bad PR and disastrous launch, they could fix the game through patches and DLC updates, but I honestly don't see that happening. After all, this game sold well. What incentive do they have to fix the game? They're a corporate machine. They'll probably just make DLC that just adds content and don't fix the main game. And most of the team probably already abandoned this project and has moved on to working on the next installment for a 2024 or 2025 release. Still, like I said in the intro, it's the best Pokemon game since Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. After 8 years of mid to very bad Pokemon games, I finally got one that I enjoyed. I guess the real question is, because I keep getting asked this, would I recommend the game? Well, unlike the other Switch Pokemon games, I will not dissuade you from trying out the game. I think if you're into Pokemon, you can probably get a kick out of this. But, I suggest buying it if it's on sale. It's not worth 60 damn dollars. Or better yet, buy second hand so your money doesn't support Ishihara's next orgy party. And if you're a person that cannot stand bugs, eye raping graphics, lazy animations, or just overall unpolished gameplay, I don't recommend it. I don't have much to say about the game other than that. The conclusion of the question of whether Scott and Invalid is a good game despite the problems is... It's mixed. This game was just a lot of missed opportunities, very frustrating. Ugh. 
I think I'll end this game review with a great quote by the father of all YouTubers on the platform. Mind you, he talks about Mega Man here, and Mega Man 11 came out a year after this and got great reviews. Here we go. You never rush out anything just to meet consumer demand, otherwise you end up putting out shit. Some franchises get done to death. You can't keep beating the same thing into the ground.